Bibles this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I was going to talk about conquering the fear of handicap, which we'll do next week. Amen. Kicking the trash can around. You have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Galatians 5. We're going to talk about freedom in Christ. Sometimes we, some ideas take freedom in Christ to a whole weird level. I'm not taking freedom in Christ to a whole weird level, but I'm talking that we can do great and mighty things to the Holy Spirit and through His guidance. Amen? Amen. If you look at verse 1 right off the bat, it says this, It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Just that one verse right there should be the precedent of who we are. Amen? When you look at this verse, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Do you understand that the things of your past can no longer have a hold on you, that you can walk in the freedom of Christ? Sometimes we look at the past and we allow that to dictate who we are in the future. And sometimes we have to understand that God has already given us freedom. We're no longer in bondage to that. Unfortunately, we as human beings, we keep allowing the past to creep up and we need to kick it to the curb. Amen. Amen. We allow things to define us because other people use our past to define us. But the Lord has given us a good and clear conscience when we have accepted Jesus and asked asked for forgiveness for our sins. But we have to realize the devil wants to trip you up, so he's going to remind you of your past. But we can, as you mostly will know, that we can remind him of his future. Amen? But it says this. This is key. The next two words out of that is we know that we have freedom in Christ. The next two words is stand firm. Those two words means that you will not be swayed, uh, deterred, or removed from your, your path right away. Here's what happens, though. The the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to bring up your past, and you try to remind him of your future. But our self-existence, we get tripped up sometimes, and we forget that we have the ability to stand firm on the Word of God, right? His his strength, His Word, is is, is sharper than any double-edged sword that can pierce our very being, amen? The fact is that we sometimes forget that this is important to us. It becomes a coffee table book. Oh, no one's going to say amen with that one. See, what happens is we forget the word of God is sharper and living and active. And this becomes a foundation for us. We come to church, our once a week church service, and we come in and we sit down in our blessed assurance and and we sit and to receive. But do you know that there's a whole lot more than coming to church, sitting in your seat and saying, I'm just going to receive from you. Throughout the scriptures, we can see that God tells us and guides us and directs us through life and through his word. He can speak directly to you through his word. He can speak directly to you through through many different avenues. But if we never get into the word of God, how are we supposed to allow it to transform us through the Holy Spirit? How, How are we supposed to be guided if we never read the instruction book? We sometimes, we still let it sit there on our shelf and it becomes dusty. I've actually been in houses that I've visited, not here, of course, because we're all holy, um, that literally has coffee stained right on the book cover. And because they've never opened it up, it just became a blessed assurance coffee coaster. Mm-hmm. Come on. Church, we need to understand that God's word is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. But stand firm in what you believe, church. Know what you believe. Know what you believe. If someone could find evidence of your belief in Christ, would it be enough to convict you? Mm, come on. If, if they can't see Christ in you, how are they going to know the true and, 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 and forgiveness and the righteousness of Christ if we never show them? Because we're not standing firm, because we're looking like everybody else. Come on. See, back in the day, the churches got caught up in how you should look at church. The Bible says that God does not look at the outer appearance. He looks at the heart. Church, come on. we got to stop having a fashion show and have a God show. We need to understand that God is in control.
control and not you or I. God is in control. Why do we get so caught up in what you look like or what I look like? It should be how we speak and how we praise and how we worship and the attitude of our heart. Because it says that if we, don't, if we don't stand for anything, we'll fall for everything. And that is what is happening to the church today. It is falling for everything. Whatever is good, whatever looks, and what is rocking, whatever is cool, that's what the church is going to do. Church, we're not going to do that. Amen. We're a Pentecostal church. Yes. We should be the most vibrant church in all of Burlington. That's right. If people want to see some Pentecostals, they should come and see us. Amen. But here's the fact is that God needs to stir up the gift of God in you. We need to see the signs and wonders again. We need to see God move and forget the fashion show. Let's see God show up like never before where the altars are filled and signs and wonders and healings are taking place. Hallelujah. But we got to get back to that. We have to get back to the freedom in Christ. I love it that sometimes if some people, some churches have taken that statement, freedom in Christ, to the nth degree, and some churches have never allowed the, the freedom in Christ to move. Yes. We have an issue in America today. People are fearful of the freedom of Christ because what if a prophetic person comes into your church and he points you out and says there's something in your life that needs to be changed? Oh, change. yeah. change. yes. We would say change it. Yeah. But that person feels like they've just been called out. And they feel like, well, you're calling, you're embarrassing me. You're offending me. You're, you're, can I tell you something? Church, that may happen here. It won't happen right now unless God gives me something. Yep. But if you're, if you're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit and ready for God to speak to you, yes, that's right. then you're going to take offense with it. Yeah. Yes. And then what I'll call you, I'll tell you what that is. It's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's yes. described yes. in the Bible. Yes, exactly. We have to understand that, that our church needs to move in that freedom. Our lives need to be in that, move in that freedom. But then we need to go back to those two words, to stand firm. Yes. Stand firm in the word of God. Stand firm in what you believe in. Know what you believe. Do not let yourselves be yoked again by the yoke of slavery. You're past. Hallelujah. I want you to drop down to verse 7. Skipping a lot of different things in, in this portion of 2 to, to 6 talks about uh, being circumcised and, and the circumcision of the heart. And, and, and I want to run down to 7 though because I think it's pertinent for us as a, as a church and as a, individuals. It says this in the NIV. It says, you were running a good race who cut, on, cut in on you. I kept you from obeying the truth. That kind of persuasion does not come from one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty. Whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been established. As for abolished, as for the agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers, who are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, rather serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So let's deal with verse 7. You keep running and who cuts you off? Who cuts in on you? Who trips you up? I'm a big fan of cycling, you know that, and I, the last couple of days, and it was sort of just yesterday is the Tour de France, and if you ever get to watch that, it's, it's a killer. It's because there's many bikers out there, and they're doing 45 miles per hour on a, on a road bike in rainy situations, and yesterday as they're 500 feet away from the, the end, the, 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 the crossing over the finish line, this bike cyclist fell over. He took three other cyclists with him. 
When you're going 45 miles per hour going to the finish line because you want to get there very fast because that's your point of ending, and you're going like that fast and you get tripped up, you get hurt. When I begin to think about that, I, I, when you look at this and who's cutting you off, we know that Satan is cutting you off. Yes. He's trying to trip you up. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, we cut off each other. Yes. And we trip each other up and we hurt one another. Can I tell you something that we need to encourage one another to, to finish the race that is in front of us? Yes. The fact is sometimes we don't do that. We trip each other up because we go back to the front that, that we, we our freedom. We, we, we look at our freedom and we try to, we come to that we have become so spiritually minded that we're no good. I've been in churches in, in, all across America where there are churchgoers that have their level of spirituality. I'm a 10, but you're like a 1, so I'm going to judge you. People that come into our church, can I tell you that if we continue to look at it, and I'm not saying that we do, but if the American church keeps looking at the outer appearance, the church will not grow. If we continue to judge people when they come in the door, no matter what they are, they look like or act like, or, or come on, I'm going to tell you, I want rough people in here, and I want rough, you to love rough people. Amen. Because I get to play, I get to hang out with rough people all the time, and you know what? I would love to see all the rough people that I get to hang out with come to church, whether, whether they're law enforcement or street people. Whatever addictions they come with, God can heal them. Sometimes I've heard it said that if we have butts in the parking lot and we'll have more butts in the pew. I know smoking is not a good habit. I know this statement. The temple, the, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm not justifying their smoking. I'm just saying, hey, if we judge them based on their smoking, I'm going to tell you that we'll never have a smoker in this place. Don't they need Jesus like you need Jesus? What about a drug addict? We may not like their, their behavior, but can I tell you something? I've counseled more people, and, and in fact, uh, uh, in the last months, I've been counseling a couple, and, and I, I've caught, caught one of them swearing ever so often during, uh, and, and I'll tell you what, what are we going to do? Don't do that. I'll tell you something this. That God loves the heart of every person. And he died for every sinner. Yes. 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 And we can't be so self-righteous that anyone that comes through our door, we judge them. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. We'll never grow. Mm -hmm. I was sitting down in a leadership meeting uh, in the city. With, with We're studying a book about leadership. And we were talking about Burlington. And we're talking about why more uh, businesses don't come in. Why is this happening? And, and then I started thinking, okay, churches today. I call it the good old boy syndrome. It's us and no more. We like who we have and we're comfortable with who we have because we know each other. If someone new comes in, then we're like, oh, they're not part of the good old boy network, so they can't really be here, so we'll ice them out. So I started talking to them. I said, here's the problem is, is the good boy old network is, 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 is the driving force. If we get rid of the good old boy network and allow anyone to come in that God has brought, let's accept them. Yes. Is that going to challenge you? Yes. Am I saying everything is okay? Absolutely not. I'm thinking God has to change your heart and you or I can't do it. That's right. Amen? That's right. Amen. Hope that's okay that I said that. Yeah, yes. Some of you guys are going to call me up and say, I can't believe you think smoking's okay. I didn't say that. Just want to clarify that. It said in verse 15, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Yes. Churches today around America are imploding. The church as a whole is not growing. Statistically, we're, we're on a downward slide. The Pentecostal church today... The level of people being baptized with the Holy Spirit is a down to all-time low. Yeah. 
for, for SEP overseas. Where Wales is going to get saved because Abby's going to be used to speak into those crazy teenagers. If you look at verse 16, it says, So I, I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. Live by the Spirit. What does that look like? That you're going to live according to God's Holy Spirit. That you're going to live according to His Word. You will not give in to your sinful nature. We have a problem today. If I counsel like three or four pastors a year that's dealing with pornography, there's a problem in the leadership of, of our world. That's right. yeah. I praise the Lord, and I always say this when I talk about it, I praise the Lord that I never had that issue. But God keeps opening the door for me to counsel people that have that problem. I don't understand why, because I don't know what they go through. But the fact is, there's an epidemic, there is a disease in our world today. A sinful, we whatever feels good, do it mentality. If it, if it makes you feel loved and accepted, do it. If you, you know, whatever, just do it. Um, according to Scripture, if we live our lives according to Scriptures, there's actually some guidelines to, for us to live in. It, it, it's called the Ten Commandments in Exodus. Amen? Yes. And we find more out throughout the Scriptures about uh, morality. Verse 17 says, For the sinful nature was contrary to the Spirit. Of course, anything dark and light. The Bible says where, where uh, darkness is, where light is, darkness cannot have place. Right? Yeah. You can't have be a Christian and still live in the darkness of the world. You will, that's where that sinful nature, that's where that thing collides. That's where you have to fight. Amen? Amen. It's not always easy. Amen? Yes. Amen. Right. Come on, we live in a world that, 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 that your sinful nature sometimes takes over, but you can have the ability to repent because the Bible says that if you ask for forgiveness, he will forgive you and throw your sins further than the eyes can see. Amen? The fact is we sometimes get caught up with that sinful nature, but we know that if we live according to the word of God and we start claiming healing over those addictions, over those bondage, we can make it. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Of course, we're going to hit 19. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, orgies, the like, I warn you, and as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you want me to read that to you again, or are you okay with it? If we, this is our world today. This is the description of America and around the world, is, is sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Discord, jealousy, fits of race, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies. They, this is the world today. We, we are having issues with this world today. And it says that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. The fact is, we say that because you're doing this. This is your problem. This is your issue. We, we don't like you because you're not going to enter heaven. Can I tell you something, church? That God can change the heart of any individual. If we continue to judge them, they'll never get saved because we already condemned them, and that's not our job. That's right. Hallelujah. So how do we respond? Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I have to admit to you that last one is very difficult for me. Self-control is probably the most difficult thing for me to have. When I'm stressed or I feel angry, self-control is not one that you should tell. You need to get control. That's just going to tick me off a whole lot more. So I have to admit to you, that's the thing that God's working on me right now with self-control. But we have to have the spirit of love. What does that look like? Does that mean that we accept everything that happens? No, we don't. God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. There's a big difference, isn't there? Loving an individual and not being acceptance of what they're doing. You can do that. 
Amen? Amen. Against such things there are no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desire. Listen to this. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envy each other. I love that statement. Let us keep in step with the Holy Spirit. We're here today, speaking of freedom, tomorrow represents the freedom, July 4th, Independence Day. I believe that every Sunday should be Independence Day for our church and for our lives. I believe that that if we truly want to see freedom reign in this place, like we sung, then we better be seeking after God's freedom in our own lives. And I believe that that how to do that is truly repent. Truly a changed life. When you look at your own life, and I look at mine and evaluate our lives, what things are going on inside you that is not pleasing to God? What things that you have done or said that are not pleasing to God, and what are you going to do about it? This is not me judging. This is me saying evaluate your life. Because I'll tell you the truth that, like I do, I don't always please God. What? You're the pastor. You're supposed to be perfect. I'm not perfect, by the way. I, I look I look at my life every single day, and I there's not a perfection bone in my body. I pray that I live a godly life every single day. I pray that I, I do what I'm supposed to do, that I represent you guys well, and I represent my family well, and I live in self-control, even though that's the hardest thing I'm dealing with right now. But as you look at your life, and you evaluate, what things in your life do you have to change? What things does not represent Christ well? That's a hard thing to do. It might be, well, this week I messed up and I cussed. Mm, Repent. This week I viewed something inappropriate. Repent. This week I gossiped about somebody. Repent. This week I did this or that. And you can fill in the blank and All I can tell you is repent because God will forgive you. Don't give into that sinful nature that that drives you. Give in to Jesus. I'm speaking from someone that repents, that lives a life of repentance. What does that mean? That means you check yourself before you wreck yourself. That you keep yourself in alignment with the scriptures, you keep yourself in alignment with God, and you pray a whole bunch. I find my greatest place to pray is when I'm riding my bike. Yesterday I prayed a whole lot with the rain. Lord, make the rain stop. That's what I prayed. And all the farmers going, no way. I was praying that. But I, I found myself in a place where I was riding the back roads, just thanking Jesus for a couple things. Just a couple. One, I thank the Lord for you guys. Because I see so much potential that God has in your life. But then on the other side, my heart weeps because we're not really following the full thing that God has for us. The second thing I'm very I'm thankful for is friends and family. You guys are part of my friends and family. I don't have family. I have them in Florida. And Carrie has hers in, in Washington. So I'm thankful for friends and family. So I, I'm thankful for you again. You should feel really blessed. Mm-hmm. I'm thankful for my girls and my, my wife. I'm thankful for where God has placed us. Yes. Amen. But here's the deal. When we evaluate our life, are we living in the standard that Christ has called us to live? Are we living in that freedom that God has called us to live? Mm-hmm. If we can say yes, then please come and preach to me. 
the Lord's working out many things in my life, and I'm not sure he's working those out in your life, if you truly follow the word of God. Amen? Amen. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and at this moment, I'm going to read a couple passages of Scripture that is in Galatians as you're evaluating your checklist. We're going to deal with the sinful nature. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, Drunkenness, orgies, and I'm sure you can add a whole lot more to that. As you evaluate your life, I just let, read the list. If there's anything in your life right now that is attached to any of those words, just repent. Ask the Lord to forgive you. The great thing about it, he will. Hallelujah. Next part of this, I'm going to speak into your life. I speak into your life a spirit of love, a spirit of joy, a spirit of peace the spirit of patience, the spirit of kindness, the spirit of goodness, the spirit of faithfulness, the spirit of gentleness, the spirit of self-control. Lord, I pray right now for every individual in this room that we may walk in the freedom of Christ in our life. May we put away our sinful nature and live according to your word, according to your mind, according to your spirit, according and living according to all that you ask of us, that we may do it with joy and peace in our heart. That, Lord, that you may guide our very walk. I pray a blessing upon every single person, Lord, this church family, that, Lord, that you continue to pour out your spirit upon them. That, Lord, that you pour out your love upon them. That, Lord, you pour, pour out your joy upon them. That you pour out your, their, your peace upon them. And, Lord, I thank you for that. And I do pray, Lord Jesus, that as we celebrate Independence Day in America, that, Lord, we celebrate the freedom that we can have in you. Lord, I pray that you bless every single person in your name. Amen.